Hello, everybody. My name is Dave Kutowski. I'm the founder and host of the Elevate Academy show. We are a place for student athletes, their families, anyone who loves sports to gather together to elevate each other. We bring you some of the best coaches, athletes, business executives, and influencers who can all help you be the best you can be in everything you do. Our goal is to focus on the complete person, mind, body, game, and life. So buckle up. Let's elevate. And today we have Pat McCabe on the show. Uh, Pat, so pumped to have you on here. Well, let me just give people a, a little bit of background. Because when I was going over your bio, you have to be one of the most winningest people I've ever had on the show. You're the current head coach at Adelphi University, uh, women's lacrosse. In his first five years at the program, Pat's already won three national championships. And that was the first five years. This was his sixth year. Obviously, everything was cut short with COVID. Wherever Pat has played a coach, championships have followed. He's originally from Elmont High School, and we have a lot of mutual friends from Elmont, where he won a state championship in his your senior year, I think. Yeah. He then went on to Syracuse University, where he was a four-time All-American and won three national championships at Syracuse. He went on to play professional cross both for the New York Saints of the NLL and the Long Island Lizards of the MLL. And with the Lizards, he won two world championships with the Lizards. He's won two gold medals with Team USA, um, where he got to wear the red, white, and blue. So, Pat McCabe, you are the winningest person we've had so far on the Elevate Academy show. That's very nice of you to say. You know, um, I, I get asked that a lot, you know, as far as my career and the success that my teams have had. And I, I think it all goes back to anything with team sports. I've been very fortunate to land in the right place at the right time um, pretty often. So high school was kind of a culmination of a lot of guys' growth and development at the high school level. We all peaked at the same time. I, I was in a great class uh, of What's guys. I mean, the names on that team that you had. I you mean, know, let's, let's throw out some of the names on that team. Well, on that team, my senior year was, was Matt Panetta, uh, was on attack, you know, um, Vinny Marinelli, I mean, uh, Mike Marinelli on attack with him, you know, Vinny's younger brother who you played with Vinny for a year. Um, then we had Kenny Sherman who went on to St. John's, Chris McKeo who went on to Adelphi. Uh, we had some younger guys, Gary Nelson, another Brown guy, Warren Spirit, who, uh, you know, there were a lot of guys. So I think we sent 10 guys to division one school. Who was your goalie that year? Was it, was it Ian Savory or was he, or was he older? It was Ivan. It was Mark Lamanti who was, an, uh, was our was our starter, and he went on to play at Towson, but he got hurt midway through the year, and Ivan replaced him, and Ivan never gave the job up. But Mark was 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 so good that even with with kind of getting jumped over that way by Ivan, he was still a Division One you know college goalie. So then Ivan went on to post, and, and he had a good career there. So we had a lot of guys who went on to play at. at mostly at the division one level, but a lot of college guys. And, and but that was the same core of guys who were on our football team who did every, you know, we did everything together. So it kind of didn't matter what we were doing. We were doing it together. That was a pretty tight group of people. Yeah. I remember, I, I forget who you guys were playing, but I remember it was the first time I had ever actually seen you play. You were playing, it was at Hofstra and, um, and I went, uh, I think I went because of the Marinelli's and I went to go see the game. And you guys are playing, I don't know if it was the Long Island Championship or it might have been like the downstate championships or whatever. Um, it might have even been the state championship. I, I don't recall, but it was, it was definitely, it was your senior year. And I remember watching you play and I was like, holy cow, this is one of the best defensemen I've ever seen play the game. And I was blown away the first time I ever saw you play. And I don't know if I've ever told you that, but I, I remember it distinctly watching, you know, like, wow, he is – Heads and tails, just better than everyone else out there. I was fortunate. I had a coach in high school in Walt Sasson who gave me a lot of freedom. So that combined with, you know, playing with a group of guys on the defense like Jimmy Sheen and a guy named Sal Reale and Mike Suba was a guy who was on the team uh, when I was a junior. They kind of backed me up pretty good, which allowed me to take some chances and, um, you know, I was learning a lot then. I was learning how to fail. I was learning how to, you know, go through things and experiment. And fortunately, Walt was a guy who really was really hard on me uh, in the best possible way, but at the same time allowed me the freedom and encouraged me to take chances and experiment a little bit. So, you know, I, I had fun back then. I really did. I, I mean, I, I always had fun playing the game, but he allowed me to have fun. He reined me in at times too. 
Um, but for the most part, he allowed me to, to experiment. Yeah, which is, which is unbelievable. You know, small world thing is uh, my wife's uncle, uh, her uncle Victor, he and Walt Sofsian were high school football captains together. John so, Adams High School. Yeah, so one, one day we were talking about it, and he's like, he's like, do you know Walt Sofsian, the lacrosse coach in Belmont? I'm like, of course I do. I also know him from refing a million of my games. And he's like, yeah, we were captains together. I was like, wow, that's a, that's a, that's a small world type thing. He was a great, he was a great college, high school and college quarterback. He was, he was one, of the, one of the greatest athletes around of his time. He really was. And, and he was, what people don't realize about him because he's so talked about athletically is he was probably the best math teacher. If anyone ever had him as a math teacher, he was one of the best you ever had. Wow, he that's amazing. He simplified the biggest problems. And, I, and he was able to do that in life too. So he, he was able to pick things apart into small pieces and solve problems. And he taught us how to do that. And it, he was a great, great educator. Well, you know what's hilarious? I don't know if you know this or not, but my, my favorite math teacher ever was Brian O'Keefe's dad. Ah. Um, Mr. O'Keefe, he was my math teacher. And, um, and the other thing that a lot of people didn't know about is that Mr. O'Keefe would teach math at the, at the jail. Um, right in East Meadow. You know, one of, one of the benefits growing up in East Meadow is you get the jail right there. Right. And, uh, and Mr. O'Keefe would actually teach math at the jail on weekends. And uh, he was such a great guy. But the thing that I loved about Mr. O'Keefe was he made math fun. He was actually a funny guy and he always made it fun. And uh, just a great guy. He passed away a few years ago, but uh, missed him. But, you know, another, another lacrosse connection with the O'Keefe yeah. family and, and Mac but those those teachers and coaches are the one the, the, those are the ones that make an impression on your life and you never forget them. Oh, absolutely. And you know, and the, the good ones. And you know, you talk about Walt letting you take chances. You then go to Syracuse University, where you're coached by a legendary coach who literally everyone I've talked to, whether it be Gary Gate or Tommy Marichek, they they say the same thing. They said they let us play our game and our style. What was it like playing for, for Simmons? Well, it was about a lot more than lacrosse. You know, that was the fun part of it. Um, you know, we, we didn't realize it at the time, how lucky we were. We, we kind of thought it was just this extravagance and this, you know, eccentric person. But you, you, you look back on it and you, you get a little smarter every year as we get older. Um, the funny thing that I was playing golf with, with a few of my college roommates the other day, you know, Jerry DiLorenzo, a guy named Paul Cannon, and a guy named Tim Corcoran, um, who are, we all... Jerry DiLorenzo, Levittown Division, baby. One of the best goalies you could ever come across. But we were talking, and, and they're, they're, we're telling stories about different times. And they, they, they tell me a story. My, 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 one of my best friends is, is Paul Cannon. He, he says, you don't, re you don't realize the times that D John Desco wanted to kill you. <laughs> and Simi kind of talked him down, like, no, leave him alone. Let him go, let him go, let him go. And I didn't realize it because I wasn't on the sideline at the time. I was on the field, but I knew that I made John crazy at times. Um, but John also taught me a lot and he, he refined a lot of what I wanted to do. Taught me a little bit more about timing and picking your, your spots a little bit better and, and patience. But they were a good one-two punch for me in that John you know, had me a little bit on edge at times and Simi allowed me to the freedom to go and they managed each other a little bit on that level. So it was, it was a really good combination for all three of us, I think. But Simi was, was, you know, I talked to him as often as I can, you know, I, I still talk to him. I still make a point to call him now and then. And I, I, I love to sit with him and talk and listen more than anything um, because it's uh there's a lot to learn from him. Even at this point in my life and his, there are still things that come across in those conversations that um, I think helped me. So I, I, I you know, I, I get every chance I'm I can. Goosebumps. I'm giving me goosebumps because I'm telling you, it's like people like that, that they are a, a once in a lifetime, you know, coach that, you know, you're in front of. And you know, when you're younger, you may not realize it as much. And as you get older um, and the relationships develop and they actually get deeper, um, and that's what I try to explain to people. It's like, you know, when you have a great coach, they're your coach for the rest of your life, not just for, you know, three or yeah, four. And, and I couldn't tell you, and this is going to sound strange, and, and some people would say, how, how dare you say that, but I couldn't tell you five things he taught me about lacrosse. 
you know, I, I just couldn't pick them out. I mean, it, it, it's more about life and how to live and, you know, how to treat people. And, and you know, you, you talk about the times we're going through now. He lived through a time when Jim Brown was on the lacrosse team. He was Jim Brown's roommate on the road. Uh, his father was the coach. And they were dealing with these extraordinary times back then. And Jim was a rock star. He was famous, but still the world was different. And he was a part of that and he grew to understand. And he, he, we'd have conversations about things like that. You know, the things that the relationships he has with the Native American community and the respect he has for the Native American community. So he's a person who taught you um, that there's a, there's a way to be and there's a way not to be. And the most important thing in life is that you treat people the way you'd like to be treated and the way everybody deserves. And that is one of the things, you know, on the road, on a bus, in a hotel, in a restaurant, he was always the most gracious person to everybody, regardless of um, what it is they could or could not do for him. And I think that's a valuable lesson that we all learn that way. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, it's uh, having that connection, though, to the Native American game, I think is is so unique. You had it. We had it through Dom Starship because Dom's roommate um, at Brown was a guy by the name of Dave White, who was an Iroquois Indian. And Dom, when Dom was from Valley Stream, which is, you know, one town over from Melmont, and he didn't even have lacrosse in his high school. And he started playing lacrosse as, as a freshman at Brown, the first time he ever picked up a stick. And his introduction, though, was going up into the summer leagues and playing box lacrosse on the Indian reservations with Dave White. And, you know, he talks about it. And, um, you know, one of the coolest things is, is when I had, I had Dom on the show, but I got to watch Dom being inducted into the, um, the Lake Placid, you know, honor society up there and had Dave White there and, and talking about that connection to the game and the Native Americans. And, and I think it's so important that we have that. Yeah, and I will tell you that as a college guy and as a younger guy, I did not appreciate it. I didn't. Um... But we didn't know about it. I didn't pay enough attention to it. It was not given the credit I don't think it deserved then. Uh, I don't, still don't think it's given the credit it deserves now. Um, but we didn't talk about it as much. It wasn't something that um, was, you know, as, as common. And we had the, the reservation up there. The Onondaga Nation was, was very close. And I was asked to go play on the box there, and I never did. And I should have done that. Um, but as you get older, like anything, the conversations you have with those older people, you realize how much smarter they, they, they are and were than you gave them credit for. You realize how much you missed, you know, the, 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 even just the relationships with certain people that you didn't take advantage of. And I don't mean take advantage of to your own benefit. I mean, take advantage of because it improves everyone's life. It's just something you should have, you know, made the most of your access to people. So you, you miss things when you're young because you're busy being busy. And I yeah. think that that's something that you know, I think young people have to focus on is slow down, um, maximize your relationships, care about people, understand that, um, you know, there's a lot to be um, gained informationally and from a knowledge point of view, if you just sit down and slow down and listen. Right. Well, you know, for me personally, you know, We've gone back a long time. We played against each other in college. Then, um, you know, we played against each other in club. And then, you know, we, we didn't – my first time that I got to actually play is when I moved over to Long Island House for the cross club. And, you know, back then what people don't realize is, you know, those club days, they were as good or even better because of the number of teams that were playing than what the pro games were. And, you know, it was a who's who's roster. I mean, as an example – I barely could get on the field at Long Island Hofstra because the starting defense was Pat McCabe, John D. Tommaso, and uh, Envy Jackson. Uh, and also, all three of them were on the world team. <laughs> and Reed played with a short stick in those world games in 98. You know, we had guys on, on those Long Island teams. You know, I could go back even further and go to the Freeport Summer League. Oh, Dom Starcher just wrote an article about it in Inside the Cross. I don't know if you saw that yet. I haven't seen it, but. I remember my brother-in-law, Vinny Luca, who was, an, was a great player at Elmont and went on to Rutgers. He would pick me up on Sunday mornings and drive me to Freeport. And I would sit on the sideline and I'd watch and I'd see all these USA helmets and all these major college helmets going up and down the field. I didn't know who anybody was. Yeah. 
And I just knew they were all great. And it was the best players in the world playing on a dust bowl field in Freeport at eight o'clock on a Sunday morning when they were all out the night before. And they, you know, I remember guys pulling up on motorcycles and, you know, Jeeps with no tops on them. And I mean, it was just a part of their Sunday before they went to the beach. But those two hours that they played were, were tremendous. And I saw the greatest players in the world. And then you go to the club days and on our Long Island teams, and you go to all those teams, North Hempstead, Tow Bay, New York Athletic Club, and then you go down south, and those teams were phenomenal too. But that's really the beginning of the MLL because when they formed the MLL, it was very regional. It was very, you know, in your backyard. You didn't have a lot of guys from out of your area. So you might have a guy or two or, you know, maybe three or four on the roster. But for the most part, our, our original Long Island teams were our Long Island house teams with the Lizards. Yep. Well, what's amazing too is, you know, I uh, – you know, someone asked me, they said, you know, you played in a lot of games. Like, is there one game that kind of stands out? And I said, I, I say it's the same game every time. And I don't know if you remember it, but it was the semifinal game. We were playing um, what was, you know, the the Maryland team down there with the Gates and Quint Kessinich and goal and uh, that, that whole Maryland, you know, squad that they had. We were losing 9 nothing, And Tommy Marachek tried a backbreaker on Sal and Sal cross-checked him in the throat and got a, got a, I think he got a two minute penalty and we had to throw Jigs in the goal and Jigs made a save and, and we ended up scoring man down and we turned the corner. It was nine to one. And we came back. I think we won 14, 13. Matt Panetta scored his seventh goal. And I think it was you stripping one of the gates at the end of the game and firing like a 70 yard pass up to Panetta scored with nine seconds. And we won 14, 13 after being down nine, nothing. Yeah. I, my memory is, is not what it used to be. I, I, you know, we had a lot of games like that where then the beauty of club back then was the games were so long. So it was the, it was the best and the worst at the same time. So you'd have a game where you get up early and then, you know, you, you not that you get bored, but you, you get stale and you game. And then the other team finds their footing and it's never over. And it's, and then, you know, with the length of a game, fitness comes into play and the guy, you know, you had some guys that were tremendously fit back then. Vinny Sombrato. Yeah. I mean, Vinny could run all day. And then you, then you had guys on other teams that just were like, you know, they were like horses out there, but there were so many games like that. And when you put those teams, you had Darren Lowe on those teams, Kevin Lowe, you know, you, that's your attack, Darren, Kevin, and Matt Panetta. They throw in Paul Gancy, you know, you, you throw in on the midfield. Randy Natoli was 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 really older at that point and towards the yeah, end. Virginia the legends. Court. Yeah, you, you know, Gordon Purdy, you had you Miko know, Red Blake, Arrow. Blake Miller, Miko. There's a million guys. Um, you know, and you talk about, you know, you mentioned Sal taking a penalty and Jiggs coming in the game. Jiggs was when Sal decided to stay on the boat, Jiggs was the best goalie out there. And then Sal would come moseying onto the field from the boat and Jigs would get pissed off because we like Sal's going in now. Yeah. <laughs> so, but he was a trooper about it. He was, he was a really important part of those teams, Jigsy. Um, but Sal was Sal and it was, it was really hard. That was a, that was an interesting dynamic between a lot of guys because even like John D. Tommaso wouldn't play every year, but when he would get geared up for, you know, 85 for the 86 world games, you know, 89 for the 90 games, and he'd get his, his round his game out with Long Island and everybody who was playing in those years that they weren't around or those times they weren't around understood they, you know, this is really their team and I've kind of been a placeholder and now they're back. Exactly. Exactly. But there were a lot of guys. And you know, what's amazing is when you talk about, you know, one of the, the benefits of being, you know, a great player is they make their teammates better. I remember watching so many players just get better because of, who they were surrounded by, you know, um, you know, being around a guy like Timmy Sher made me not only a better player, a better human. I mean, Timmy Sher is one of the best people in the world. And it's like getting the opportunity to play with him and then ha watching him. I, I felt more proud of him making the world team than I think he felt for himself. Cause it's like, that's the type of guy he was. Well, he's an except. I, he's the guy I use as a reference when someone says someone's a nice guy. I say, yeah, but he's no Timmy Sher. Yeah. And that, that's you can meet the nicest person in the world. It's still not as nice as Timmy Sharp. But I, I, you know, when you talk about getting better with better players, I, I use the example all the time of, you know, I thought when I got out of high school, I thought I was pretty good. 
and I got to college and I realized I didn't know anything. You know, I didn't know, I didn't understand the game the way it worked. I didn't know how to play. And I got on a team with a lot of very smart players. Um, you know, I just got the phone on the way home today. I'm talking to Matty Palm on the phone. Um, and we just, you know, throw it back and forth about the days, but he's one of the smartest college players I ever met. And he's only a year older than me, but he was, you know, Greg Burns, Matt Palin, John Zilberti, Steve Scarmer, you know, these guys were, were brilliant lacrosse minds and they were young yeah. and were mature beyond their years. Then I figure I get out of college and all right, I got to figure it out. Now I go to play, play my first year with North Hempstead. But when I get to Long Island the following year, I'm like, wow, I really still don't know anything because I'm playing with John DiTomaso, I'm playing with Tommy Martello playing with Vinny and Steven Sombrato and, and all these other guys and Billy Burroughs is there and John Phillips is there and they are a wealth of information. So you could think you reached the point. Then I'm figuring, all right, there, I got it figured out. And I did, I go play for the U S team and I play for Bill Tierney. So now I'm older. My style is changing because I'm getting older and I get to learn from a guy who um, built what is basically system defense. Sure. And now I get to learn that firsthand from him and we had fun in that teacher student relationship. And I, and I loved every, and people are, oh, you couldn't play for Bill Tierney. I'm like, you know what? I played for Bill Tierney and I loved it. And as a young player, I would have loved it because I think we would have had that same kind of situation I had with John Desco where he didn't love what I did all the time, but he would tolerate it and he'd make sure I fit into his system, but with a little bit of my style. So well, it's I funny. I was, I was talking, I was having a conversation, um, probably about a year and a half ago with Dave Petromala. And I, I was saying to him, I said, Petro, probably one of the best lacrosse games I ever watched was the 1989 Syracuse Hopkins game. And that game, I think he had like four shots. You might have taken two or three shots in that game. You had just checks being thrown at the, at the midfield line. Um, there was one of the greatest passes I ever saw with Paul Gate ripped a behind the back pass like 30 yards to like the restraining line um, to his brother for a goal. And it was just like, it, it was a game that's like, that's the way lacrosse is meant to play. And it's that fast pace, that up tempo. Well, the speed of that game, you know, you, you look at that. I've had this conversation recently with uh, Booker Corrigan, Matt Panetta and I did this and like they were known as playing slow and we were known as playing fast, but they could play fast as well as we could. We could not play as slow the way they wanted to and do it well. Right. But they could play fast and we were trying to keep the tempo going and they were right along there with us to the point where it's a one goal game. But I, I, I believe I remember this. I don't think, I think Dave and I both took one shot in that game. Dave's didn't get to the goal because Gary checked it out of his stick, but mine was saved by Quint and put in, behind the back by Tommy Marichek off a scrum in front of the goal. So, and if I'd, if I'd have got that one by him, that would have been, oh, yeah. that would have been an all time moment for me. But Greg Burns, if you ever see that game, which you're absolutely correct, is it's one of the greatest games ever. But Greg Burns, I talk about being smart. He, he's on the ground and he's flailing and, he, and he, he doesn't do this on accident. He smacks the ball on the ground over to Tommy who's on the other side of the goal wide open. And Tommy picks it up and throws it behind his back as time runs out in the quarter, I think it was in at the end of the first maybe. Um, but just a really heads up, heady, smart play. And that was the kind of what those teams did. And their team was, it was equal to that. If that game goes on another 15 minutes, we're probably down a goal. And then if you go on another 15 minutes, it's probably tied again. You know, it's, that's the kind of game that was going to be. It was just an incredible game. It's like, you know, if, if, if you want to watch a great lacrosse game, go watch that game. Like, you know, I know they're putting on games on TV. I, I actually, I said ESPN should throw that game up on, up on there because it's, it's literally just one of the greatest games ever played. The sad part of that is the first game of the year we played them at Hopkins and we lost by a goal. And it was a, it was a great game. It was, it was the same game. And the thing I always talk about is in the press conference after the championship game, uh, one of the reporters asks Dave, what's the difference between this game and the first game? And he says, there's no difference, just a score. Yeah. And he was right because it was the same people making the same dynamic plays. Um, you know, you had uh, just a number of, of amazing players and amazing plays being made. It was the same. We just made a couple more in the second game. Right. And they just, and I, they probably tell you, they just ran out of time. 
Because I was, you know, still, I was, it, was a, it was a shame someone had to lose. I'm glad it wasn't me. Yeah. But it's a shame someone had to lose that game because it's an all-time great, you know, moment in lacrosse history. No doubt. It was unbelievable. You know, um, you know one of the things is you, you made the switch over now from, you know, doing everything on the guy's side, and you made, like, this seamless transition to the women's side. And I mean, and you know, one of the things is, what's it like? What do you, you know, because I remember the first time I started coaching girls across and, um, and Brian O'Keefe was working for STX and he said, listen, I'll, I'll, I'm going to set you up with Jen Adams. Um, you know, she's the greatest player in the world. I knew who Jen was. I followed her in college and, you know, she was a four time player of the year um, and just an absolute force. And I remember, you know, saying to Jen, what should I teach the girls? differently than you know the boys and she goes don't teach them anything differently she goes we had gary gate as a coach at maryland and that was one of the things he said he goes lacrosse is lacrosse you know stick stick work is stick work don't don't do anything differently do you find that you're doing anything differently today at adelphi than you would be if you were coaching a guy's team no i don't i don't believe that that we do uh, you know and that's funny you mentioned jen adams and gary gate because it, one of the first conversations i had with gary when i started coaching girls years ago was you know, what do you think? What should I do? And he said, coach them like boys and let the referee tell them you're wrong. Yeah. That was basically what it is because it comes down. It, it all comes down to stick work. You know, it's one of the things you got to hammer home. We, we spend so much time on, on stick work at Adelphi. It, it comes down to stick work and defense, you know, and fitness is, is a huge part of what we do. So you, you gotta, you know, we spend so much time, on handling the ball and doing it when you're tired. And, and we, we laugh all the time with the girls because it's, it's like, we know you don't like this. We know you don't want to do this, but you know, when it comes down to the last 10, 12 minutes of a game and things have been even to that point, that's where we're going to take over. And we're going to be able to do it when we're tired. We're going to be able to do it when we're sore. We're going to do it when it's hot, when it's cold, whatever it is, we're going to do it better than the other guy when it matters most because we're going to be battle tested. And I think that's really what it comes down to. The, the biggest learning point for me as a, as a coach of, of women was when I hired Frankie Caridi and I used to do all the running. And, and then when she came on the staff, um, one of the first days we were together, she, we were doing some running and I was like, all right, that's enough. And she looked at me and she's like, what are you, what are you talking about? And I said, no, we're done. She's like, no, 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 they can do more. And that's the moment I realized that I was the wrong guy for that because as a father and as a man, I was looking at it like, oh, well, they're, they're young women and I, they've done enough. And I didn't give them enough credit for how tough they were and how strong they were and how, how far they could push themselves and each other. So I said, I have to recognize my weaknesses here and my failings and say, you know what? You got, you got it. it. Thank you. Yeah, and so she's handled that that part of our program in addition to so much other stuff. But since then, it's been like, you know what? I kind of, you know, we'll we'll talk about it, but I don't get in the way when it comes to that stuff. And it's worked, you know, magnificently. Well, that's part of being a great leader, you know, is, is recognizing, you know, someone else that, that can take over something else and, and maybe even do it better than you can. Um, but, you know, I know, listen, you're, you're a very modest person. And, you know, in all the years I've known you, you, you take that, you know, that back zip roll, you give everyone else the credit. But I got to ask you, because I, when I was at Merrill Lynch, I used to go around the country and I used to speak with this guy, Dr. Dennis Kimbrough. And he wrote a book that's titled, What Makes the Great Great? And after reading his book and listening to him talk about, it, whenever I'm in front of people who I literally like look up to and, and enjoy watching them and think that they're great in what they do, I want to know. What was it that made Pat McCabe great? What was the difference? I would tell you that I, from my point of view, I think the determination of whether you're great or not is up to other people. Uh, so I don't look at it that way. I never looked at it and said, hey, look what I did. Look, you know, that I know, but, but I'm proud of I'm proud of the things I've accomplished. But I know that they're all a product of great teams and great people other than myself. Um, the thing that I, I would, I would hang my hat on at the end of the day is I wanted to win everything I did. I wanted to win. So whether I was a player, um, you know, believe it or not, I have put a lot less stress on winning as a coach than I did as a player. Cause I just think I had a, a greater ability to impact the outcome of the game as a player. Sure. So if we lost, I could wear it myself 
I think when you're a coach and you, and you, all you talk about is winning and it doesn't happen, I think you can undervalue team's accomplishments sometimes. And, and, and if you put, if you assess it as the only thing, um, the only success is winning or winning a championship, you can overlook a lot of really important accomplishments. So for me, I think as a player, I think the thing that drove me was that I didn't care about anything but winning. Uh, and, I, and if it meant that, and I used to do this, and, and when we played together, you may have recognized this, there'd be games where I wanted to cover the worst attackman on the field. And people would say, why do you want to cover him? I was like, because I, I want to slide. Ball. I want to be able to help. And if it ends up in his stick at the end of a break, I'm much more comfortable than it ended up in someone else when I leave the best guy. So I'm content to cover whoever it is. And depending on the game and the season and, and the point in my career and who I was playing with, I didn't care. You know, I was, when I'm in a championship game and I'm not on the top guy and I'm like feeling like I need to be for us to win. I don't want to be on the best guy because I want everyone to say, Hey, look, he must be really good. Cause he's on the best guy. I want to be on the best guy because I think that's how we win the game. Right. And it wasn't, that wasn't always the case. So like, I don't cover Matt Panetta for, probably 75% of our college careers because it's not a great matchup for my team to win the game. Now, at some point, my coaches decide we're going to switch things up because we think now it gives us a chance to win the game. And it worked out that way. But I didn't care. I don't think any coach I ever played for thought I cared about anything other than winning. I don't think I'm hopeful that it, there's not a teammate I ever played with that thought anything other than the fact that all he cares about is winning the game. That was it. And what did you what did you do in preparation to get yourself in that position to win, though? Because uh, I, I spent countless hours with my stick in my hand. You know, I tell kids all the time. I used to run miles around a track, picking up ground balls, picking up to my left, picking up to my right, smack them to the left, smack them to the right. Um, the walls at Elmont High School. You know, I, my kids laugh at me because I've shown them where I did it. Um, you know, I found a place where I could be comfortable and you know, work and not have to chase balls and, you know, you know, but they don't, kids don't realize today, Dave, like we had one ball. I, I say that all the time. Like today I was training, I was training a bunch of uh, my nephew and, and his friends. I was training them today, they're eight years old and having a blast with them. But I, I walk up to the field and there's a ball in the field. And I, I literally said to myself, I'm like, I would have never left the ball in the field because I only had one. Because if you would have left the ball in the field, you would have had no ball. Exactly. They don't, they don't understand. Like you're East Meadow, I'm from Elmer, right? They don't, they don't know the value of hoping that a ball hits a car tire so it doesn't go two blocks down the road. Exactly. I mean, I, I know we sound like dinosaurs here, but it's true. Like I had one ball. If the ball went on the school roof, you went on the school roof and you got the we ball climbed, back. We climbed some roofs. We, you know, we went in sewers. We did all those things because it's all you had. And ball never got it was never a greaser to us it was just the ball he had you know what i mean and exactly. that's what it was there so were no we, buckets of balls because there were also there were no lacrosse scores no you know? and think about this we talk about this all the time with my friends there weren't 10 balls on the end line at the, during a high school game if the, and there was no net behind the game so if someone took a shot and went over the track to the to the fence by the softball field everybody waited for that one poor guy to jog behind the goal over the track so he doesn't slip on his cleats because he probably have metal cleats on his feet and bring the ball back and then the referee everyone's standing there waiting to blow the whistle yeah. but as far as me like i i did i spent so much time with my stick in my hand you know i i worked on on my hands a lot um, I had some really good people around. My brother-in-law, Vinny Luca, would, would throw the ball around with me anytime. He would bring me to see guys play. I watched a lot of guys who were good. He'd tell me who to watch. Um, and I, you know, I know their names now, but I didn't know who they were then. Sure. But that's the, that's the beauty of it. It's like I even say to kids today, it's like I don't care what lacrosse or what sport it is on TV. Watch it and learn something from it. You know, if you're watching a football game, I always tell them, Watch the receiver as they go out for a pass. Watch their footwork. It's not just in one direction. They're constantly chopping their feet. They're moving their feet. You know, watch how the defensive back reacts to that receiver. What, you know, how are they playing defense? You know, what is their body position? And, you know, it's the same thing, whether you're watching basketball, because I wasn't a basketball guy. I was a wrestler. So, you know, but I've learned so much from basketball. I love taking basketball drills. I go to the, uh, 
the the uh, junior MBA website, and I still drill some of them all the time and turn them into lacrosse drills. Because they, um, they're all fundamental and their footwork and their, their fitness, you know, all that stuff is important. And the, like I watch football, I watch the linemen, you know I mean? I watch, I like to watch the mechanics of these things. I like to watch the, the little intricacies and the different things that make the whole situation go. Yeah. You know, how does the, left watch tackle, the quarterback? Watch, watch the left tackle's footwork of how they're protecting yeah. and passing. Yeah, and it's it, it, the thing is now it's so easy to do all that because you can rewind every play five times. You could do that. Um, you know, I, I asked some girls the other night at a practice, well, what's the last lacrosse game you watched? And they hadn't watched any. Right. One girl said to me, oh, my brother's game last season. I'm like, okay, that's not going to help you. Yeah. you watching your brother play. I mean, it's nice. It's good to support your family, but – if you're not getting there, it's usually because you haven't put the work in. Right. And I always prided myself on putting the work in. I felt like I was prepared. I, I never felt like I went into a game unprepared. I never felt like I didn't understand my opponent. I mean, and they were, because they were all guys you knew. Yeah. So well, even born... to, this, to this day, I mean, I always looked at it as, you know, I, I grew up, I was a goalie all the way through high school and then, you know, switched over my freshman year at Brown and, you know, I looked at it as like I learned defense from Billy McComas, who was next to me, who was the first team All American. And, and, you know, that's where I learned defense from. You know, I didn't know how to throw checks. You know, I, I was, Dom put me on the field because I was an athlete first. And, you know, it was a matter of just like, okay, you know, Billy will help you out with everything else because, you know, Dom was the same type of player. And on a field with, with you know, you talked about teammates earlier, you, you figure out your role. You figure out how do you fit in? How do I complement the people around me? And how do, how do we play off of each other? And I, I learned that in high school, playing with Jimmy Sheehan. You know, I, I love to go after guys with the ball. And back then, the ball would come out of the stick. And Jimmy loved when the ball came out of the stick. He loved cleaning the guy out. Right. So I had, a, I had a, a, like a clean slate to pick it up because he, he had the guy in a pancake at that point because that's how the game was played then. But, you know, I – I think when you, when you get the right people, one of the years I played in the MLL, it was the 03 season. The defense was me, Brian Volker, and John Gagliardi. And I never had as much fun probably or felt as comfortable as I did playing with Volker. Such a smart guy, great communicator. I was just about to say, great communicator. Yeah, he, did, he made the right play all the time. There was never any confusion. If I thought in my mind – Someone needs to be over there. I always look, and there, we, there he was. And I like to think I was there for him, too. Like, but we had a really good – interestingly enough, we played together for, like, 13 games. And it was a great 13 games. Like, we didn't need a lot of time together to, to right. get it figured out. Like, we didn't need to get a great understanding. We watched each other for so long and played against each other for so long that it just kind of hit seamlessly. And, you know, we had it – it was unspoken – pretty much. Right. Let me, let me switch gears a little bit, you know, um, and I want to turn it over more to the coaching right now. You know, as a coach, there's so many lacrosse is exploding. And, um, you know, I, I hear it today. One of my favorite quotes is that lacrosse is being overplayed and undercoached. Um, there's not enough quality coaches that are out there right now. And with that, you know, I'm a big, what you talk about, I'm a big fundamental guy. Take care of the fundamentals first. But you're out there, you, you've won three national championships in your first five years. You were on your way to, you know, competing for a fourth national championship before COVID kicked in this year. What are you looking for? What are the intangibles that you're looking for in recruits and players that you're looking at to say, hey, they're going to fit into our system here at Adelphi because of X, Y, Z? Well, first, it'll depend on what we're looking for, you know, position wise, you know, we, we've kind of altered our recruiting philosophy a little bit in, in looking more for athletes um, and figuring if you recruit a midfielder, you can teach them to do a number of things. It's much more difficult to take a, an attacker and make her a midfielder, or, you know, or defender and make her a midfielder. So, you know, you, and you have these conversations before we've had, we've, we've had young people who we've recruited and, you know, they played midfield the whole 
summer season and we bring them in and we say, you know, we're watching you and you, we like you a lot, but we project you as a defender. And, and they look at us and go, oh, good, because that's really what I want to play. I'm like, well, why are you playing on the midfield all summer? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> go out right. and do what you do best. And sometimes it's just that, and this is a good message for us, is, well, that's what my team needed. Right. Okay, then you're our kind of person. So athletes, you know, that's really important. Uh, energy and effort, I, I, you know, I can't overstate that. A kid who puts out maximum energy and effort in a summer league game or in a summer tournament, um, that kid in a national championship game or in a conference champ is going to give you everything they have. Because if they're competing like crazy in Virginia in 99 degrees, you know, in a game that they don't even know who's watching, um, then that means that they're telling you that's who they are. So that stuff's really important. Energy and effort, body language, um, you know, and then we, we run down things through club coaches like yourself and through high school coaches and, and other people who, who may have relationships or have some type of knowledge of, of that young person. Um, and, and be honest with you, we'll have a kid we like, but we see things we don't like. So when we bring them in, we say, let's start with this. What, tell me what, what happened here. You know, we'll show them film of themselves doing something in the game that we're like, we don't do that here. Right. So if this is who you are, we wish you the best, but you're not doing that here. And mom and dad, we're telling you right now that if this is how your daughter behaves here, she's not going to see the field. And you'll get answers as much as like, oh, no, that was just a one-time thing. Or I'm glad you're telling her because we've been telling her for two years. Right. And they point to me and say, you better listen you know, to the, to their daughter. So, you know, energy and effort are tremendous. Athleticism, you, you sometimes you just can't teach it. Um, but those are really the things you look for. And you need, you need grit. You watch huddles. You know, this is, I'm, I'm saying things everybody knows and things that you've been telling kids forever. We watch timeouts. We watch how they handle a huddle. We watch, you know, um, bad call. You know, it's a bad call. Kid, you know, she, you almost want the kid to get screwed on a call because you want to see how do they handle that? Do they go palms up and start running their mouth to an official? Um, I've seen kids who are, you know, juniors in high school have an issue with it, with an official. And I'm impressed with the way they handle it. You know, as they're walking off the field, they move themselves in the direction of the official and they have a really mature conversation. And I say, that's a, that's a good kid right there, that she gets it. Like right. she's not happy with the call, but she's mature enough to ask and get an explanation. And then you can see a mutual, almost respect between the young player and the, and the official where they're like, the official says, I'm going to give you an answer because of the way you approach me. Let's talk about this. And it's, it's a really good things to see because you know, when you're 80 yards away from the call on a field, you need your kids to be the representatives of your program. Sure. You need them to, you need officials to look at your kids and say, these kids know how to behave. They're really good players, but they're also really mature and good people. So I'm not saying they give you anything extra, but they, you certainly don't shoot yourselves in the foot at a big well, moment. Well, it's funny you say that because we, we had that, we had that recently where uh, a ref called one of the kids in the crease and, uh, and they scored a goal. And it was a really sweet goal, too. It would have been nice. And um, and the whole sideline was we was, was reacting. And I'm like, guys, we're 80 yards away. They're right there. You know what we'll do? When she comes off the field, let's ask her if she went in the crease before we say anything. And we, she came over and go, hey, did you go in the crease? She's like, yeah, I stepped my foot, stepped right in the crease. Yeah. I'm like, so there you go. Nice to defend your teammate and you want the goal. But, you know, I've – I've look, I was not great to officials when I played. Um you know, I, I made a, a lot of apologies over the years when I run into guys later on. Um, but I try not to be that way as a coach. You know, I'll, if I think my kids are being um, put in harm's way, right. Or, you know, that there's things that are going on that are dangerous. People will hear me. Absolutely. But, but I try not to do that. I get, I, I get caught up in it. There's, t there's moments I'm not proud of, but for the most part, I want, um, I want people to understand that we're, we're a classy program. Uh, that we do things the right way, even in the worst of our, of our, of our times, the worst of moments. Um, and it's not always easy, but I think that's when you really show who and what you are in the difficult right. times. Yeah. But, you know, it's, uh, 
it, it's awesome. And everything you talk about, it gets back to, you know, life lessons and all the things that, you know, we're trying to teach these kids. And, you know, as a coach, you're, you're doing that on a daily basis. You know, I feel like that's our, one of our responsibilities as a coach to do those things. So with, with that in mind, um, let me ask you, you know, if, if, I know this is going to be hard for you, but if you had to pick who are some of the greatest players that you've ever played the game with, who are some of those players that you would, that you would pick? And, and you've played with so many, but have any stood out? Well, you know, it'll, to be on a field with and watch what they do, Gary and Paul Gate. Yeah. Well, the yeah. funniest thing is I, I busted Dom Starsh's chops when he was on the show because when they were freshmen, the scouting report on the Gates was big, slow, all lefty Canadians. And I said, you got the Canadians and the lefty right, and everything else was wrong after that. <laughs> Hopkins, Hopkins, Hopkins had them as big, slow righties in 88. And, we, and that's why we went down to Hopkins and we beat them 19-7 in the first game of the year. Yeah. But yeah. If, as far as being on the field – and watching what they do, like just having the best seat in the house, as I always tell people all the time. Yeah. Gary, Paul, and, and I throw Tommy Marichick in there because they did such beautiful things. Um, having fun playing with, I, I have to put Matt Palin on the list because we had so much fun. We, we razzed so many guys and we got into so many. He was a talker. He could talk. He, he's just great. You, you watch these PLL games and you listen to the, the banter he has with coaches and, and, oh, yeah. and players. He's sharp. He's really smart. He's great at what he does. But he's been like that for, since he's a kid. So when I talk about guys who are smart and mature um, and just really witty, the things, we, you know, you could ask some of the guys we played against, you know, how was it? And they'd say, oh, you know, wow, dude. Maddie would make me uncomfortable to a point. Right. I was still entertained, and the guy I was covering was still laughing. Yeah. But he was not happy. Exactly. Well, but I'll tell you, I was, I was just writing about uh, something with uh, – when we played you guys my sophomore year, um, it was actually the first game I was ever starting. I would always be like the fourth defenseman rotating in. I'd always play man down. It was the first game I was starting. I was covering um, uh, Tim Nelson in that game. Um, and – but we scored, I don't know if we, we scored the first goal of the game, but whatever, whenever we scored that first goal against Matt Pelham, our entire fraternity threw like 100 oranges out on the field at Pelham. The game got stopped, and the refs basically said to Dom, someone throws another orange, you got, you know, one minute on sports. We're like, well, like, when I saw Matty Pelham, like, years later, I'm like, hey, got to apologize for the oranges being thrown at you, you know, in, the, in that first game. He's like, I thought it was hysterical. We got. We used to get that. Brown was good for that. Brown, um, they did some funny things. The thing, the problem was when you go to certain places and they wouldn't throw arms at, they they'd freeze them too. Yeah. <laughs> so they were they were throwing rocks at you essentially. Yeah. And Simi would say, "That's where Simi would smart. We were not allowed to touch them. So we let them clean up their own mess. That was basically what it was. So all the guys on the other team had to clean up after their fans. We didn't touch a single one. Exactly. And when we were in the huddle waiting for you guys to do that, Simi would say, "Boys." That's the problem when you're named after a piece of fruit. <laughs> he goes, and he would say, he goes, let's just be glad we're not the watermelons. Yeah, well, it was even worse when we were called brown because we would get called a lot of stuff from that too. Well, but, we would um, say, if it's brown, flush it. That's what our guys exactly. would say. Exactly. So <laughs> as, as, we, as we summarize this and we, we, bring it, we bring it back to like, you know, the end here and like, you know, kind of what the Elevate Academy is about, we, we have three questions at the end. So the first thing is you get a question from – our prior guest, who our prior guest was Susie Petroselli. She just came out with a new book, Raised a Warrior. She was a captain at Harvard of the women's soccer team. And it's a great book about, you know, overcoming adversity and everything. She wants to know from you, what's the most courageous act that you've ever been involved in? Oh, that's a tough one. Most courageous act. Um, I got. I have to tell you, I don't know that my life has afforded me an opportunity to do something that I would consider courageous um, when you compare it to some of the things people are doing these days. Um, Maybe it hasn't happened yet. Yeah, I, there's a. I hope my life doesn't pass me by without that opportunity. There's nothing I could look at. I mean, I've had, um, you know. I've been in situations where I've had to stand up for people. Um, 
you know, who maybe couldn't stand up for themselves, nothing significant, but where, you know, you're just in a situation where like, that guy's my friend and I'm not letting that happen. Exactly. Um, but I, I honestly could not point to anything that um, I would say has been courageous on my part. Um, only because I think it, it, anything that I've ever done pales in comparison to, to what I would call courageous. Well, that's just your modesty coming through again. But, you know, we'll, 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 I, I don't want to disappoint because that's a great no, 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 question. We'll, 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 it's we'll a great question, but it, it's not a great one for me. <laughs> yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll let Susie know. Now, you have to ask a question of our next guest. Our next guest is David Keegan. Now, he's, a, uh, he's the uh, CEO and founder of Three Step. They're like one of the biggest um, youth sports companies in the world. They, they're in six different sports and they're just exploding all over the place. Um, what's your question for the CEO of Three Step? If you could spend a week as somebody else, who would it be and why? I love it. I think you need a week to really get inside that person. I've never heard of that question before. I love it. I think you, I think if you get a week, you experience ups and downs, you, you deal with personal relationships, you deal with a lot of stuff. I, I, I like the one that people ask if, if there's three people you could have dinner with, you know, I, I like that one. But I think if you could be someone for a week um, and experience their life, who would it be and why would you choose that person? Interesting. I love it. Well, we'll definitely ask you that. And then the last question, this is it. This is like everything that we talk about when the people are watching this show and they, they look at it and say, what can we get out of it? This is it. This is the question. What's the single best piece of advice you ever got and who gave it to you? I, I was thinking about that as I was reading it. Um, and there's a story behind it, but it was, it. It, was, it was the fact that somebody showed confidence in me and didn't let a bad moment um, linger and impact me. So I was, we were playing, I don't remember if it was Adelphi or Towson, but we were playing at Manhasset High School. And we were living in different times and my coach was pretty forgiving and Simi would let me go home. So I, I was home, I slept home that night. And then I had to drive to Manhasset High School the next morning to, for the game. I, there's no GPS. There's no, you know, I don't have any understanding of traffic at the time. It's probably like 1989 or 90, probably 90. And there's no way to communicate with anyone that I'm going to be no late. No cell phones. There's nothing. I show up for the game and I'm not exaggerating 15 minutes before faceoff. <laughs> My stuff's all hanging in the locker room. John Desco's giving his speech. He's like, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to cover this guy. And he looks at me, he goes, Pat, thanks for coming. As I walk in the locker room and everyone's dressed, they'd already warmed up. They're going out for the national anthem and then they're going to play. I sit in my locker. I'm getting dressed as fast as I can. The whole team leaves the locker room. Nobody says a word to me. Everyone, you know, I, I you know, me, you know me, I love to play. I was, I went, I was at early, the first guy at every practice, the last guy to leave. I love to play. I was never late for a thing in my life when it came to lacrosse. Everyone leaves the locker room. Simi comes over, he sits next to me. Everything okay? I said, yeah. I said, I'm so sorry. You know, I, I, I'm like almost on the verge of tears at this point. He puts his arm around me, looks me in the eye, and he goes, just go out there and do what you do. Got up, walked out. I started the game. I never heard about it again. In all these years, I never heard, what the hell happened to you that day? What was going on? He knew it was not something that I would ever do again. He knew it was nothing intentional or disrespectful. He saw what I was going through, the look in my eye, and he said, this is not a time to beat the young man up. This is a time to put my arm around him. And it, I, it sticks with me to this day. Go out there and do what you do. He did everything but give me a kiss. I got, I got goosebumps. And I think I played, I, I think I scored. I, played I, had a some, I, had a similar, I had a similar story I'll tell you offline one day about a coach and same type of thing. It's like he, he gave me that, that second chance. It was Simi let me be me. Um, it made me a better person, made me a better man. Uh, and he kind of taught me that you can never judge anybody by their worst moment or their best moment, really. 
it's a body of work. It's, it's um, a combination and a culmination of experiences with somebody that, that will allow you to give an accurate judgment or an accurate assessment of who and what they are. And I think that's really important. It's, it's, as a coach, it's important. You know, you, you've got kids that have bad moments. You have kids who do brilliant things and they can never do them again. But when you have people who put the work in, they demonstrate consistency, um, they stick with it, their, their mind stays in the right place. And if those things are followed, you can accomplish great things. And I'm thankful that he gave me a chance to prove that to him. It's awesome. It's awesome. Well, listen, this is exactly what the Elevate Academy is all about, is, is getting these little tidbits and these things that, that people can use in their everyday lives, kids can use on the fields, coaches can use. That's what it's all about. So, Pat, on behalf of myself and the, the whole Elevate Academy show, this has been great. You've been a great teammate. You're a great friend. And uh, we really appreciate you being on. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for having me. And uh, hopefully I'll see you soon. All right, Pat. Listen, stay safe. We'll see you soon. Be well, Dave. Thanks again. Elevate, everybody. Take care.